I'd like to welcome you all here, uh, particularly those who have come from other campuses in D.C. and from other places in the area. I'm here to introduce someone who really needs no introduction because Professor Peter Kraft is an absolutely renowned scholar of philosophy and philosophy of religion and quite a dynamic speaker. We have the privilege of hearing from him this evening about the pro-life philosophy. He's going to take the pro-life cause and the issue and the argument and approach it from a sound philosophical point of view and get away from a lot of the polarizing political rhetoric that we hear too often in this issue. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Kraft. Steve and I agree about some things, like introduction should be short. We disagree about other things. He's a Yankee fan. I'm from Boston. <laughs> That's all right. We can agree to disagree. I'm going to try to make this talk fairly short so that there's time for questions and answers afterwards. I'm also not going to give you a formal lecture or read point by point. I've done that in books like this one. I assume that some of you at least have read a book like this, and it would be a species of theft, I think, to make you come out to a lecture to simply do what you can do at home yourself, namely listen to the words of a book. But I will be pulling ideas from the book and looking at them a little more carefully and deeply and slowly and leisurely. This is only a philosophical approach to abortion. Everything that exists, except abstractions like numbers, and even maybe they, have many aspects, many dimensions, many relationships. And certainly abortion, in one sense, is a complex issue in that it has many different uh, aspects and relationships. I do not believe it is a morally complex issue. I agree with Mother Teresa when she says, if abortion isn't wrong, what is wrong? But I'm not going to use that as an argument. I'm going to try to demonstrate it logically. But I'm not going to go into the religious aspect of abortion or the psychological aspect of abortion, or the sociological aspects of abortion, or the political aspects of abortion, or even the legal aspects of abortion, except on one point, and not the feminist aspects, the gender-based aspects of abortion, though that's relevant too, or even the scientific aspects, except again on one point that's essential for my argument. But just going to look at the philosophy, and especially the logic of the pro-life argument. It's essentially one argument, but there are many different ways to express it, and I have up here four different ways, which I will explain in a moment. Within philosophy, the division of philosophy that obviously most directly is about abortion is ethics. I will presuppose two things. If you disagree with these two presuppositions, you won't be able to sympathetically follow my argument. But I think the vast majority of people, even the vast majority of philosophers, who are certainly more insane than most people, believe these things. We have a saying in Boston, that's so crazy, only a PhD could possibly believe it. <laughs> Presupposition number one, we can argue about ethics. There's a role for reason and logic in ethics. There's no absolute divorce between truth and goodness, fact and value, logic and morality, reason and will. They're different, granted, but they can interpenetrate. The second presupposition is that if you say that we can reason about ethics, that would seem to necessitate believing that there's something real about good and evil, right and wrong, rights and duties, because we don't reason about our dreams, our fantasies, our personal creations, our purely personal likes and dislikes, our feelings, you can't argue about feelings. If you reduce ethics to feelings, ethics is no longer an argument. You never heard a conversation like this. I feel great. No, you don't. You feel terrible. <laughs> People don't argue about that. Feelings are private. <laughs> Philosophers talk about a fact-value distinction, and that's a valid point. In fact, I'm going to use that point in my argument to try to show that the pro-life argument necessarily has a fact premise and a value premise. But the distinction between facts and values is not total. It is a fact, though not a scientific fact, that there are values and that some things are valuable and some things are not. You can make meaningful statements about values. You can argue about values. We do all the time. If we didn't in fact believe that there was something like objective values, we would never have ethical arguments. We would just fight. People quarrel. They don't just fight, they quarrel. What right do you have to do that? Well, that's an ethical argument. Now, if you didn't believe these two presuppositions, I don't think you would have come here. I think you knew that we were going to talk about abortion, and I think you knew that I was a philosopher. So if you didn't think that 
you could rationally philosophize about a morally controversial issue like abortion, you would probably come here only to get angry. And I suppose some people do things only to get angry, but I assumed that that didn't happen at Georgetown. (laughs) The second presupposition that there are objective values means that total moral relativism is false. Maybe there are some things that are morally relative, morally subjective, not objective. But if you think that there's nothing that's objectively right or wrong, you're not going to argue about it. I discovered a very famous 20th century philosopher who explained moral relativism with striking clarity. His name is Benito Mussolini. Unlike Hitler, Mussolini was a philosopher. And here is a quotation from uh, a book of his. Everything I have said and done in these last years, this was after he became Italy's dictator, has been relativism. If relativism signifies contempt for fixed categories and men who claim to be the bearers of some objective immortal truth, then there is nothing more relativistic than fascism. For from the fact that all ideologies are mere fictions, the relativist infers that everyone has the right to create for himself his own ideology and to enforce it with all the energy of which he is capable. That seems perfectly reasonable to me. And therefore, since we probably don't admire Mussolini for anything except the fact that he made the trains run on time in Italy, which is the only reason we're not Nazis today, because that's why the Italian people thought he was God and loved him for a while, and that's why Hitler had Italy as his ally, and that's why Hitler had to delay his invasion of Russia until he bailed Mussolini out in Greece and Yugoslavia, and because of the delayed invasion of Russia, he lost the war. So thank the Italians for not being able to tell time. (laughs) That's from my wife. She's Italian. There may even be a third hidden presupposition in my argument, and we may want to argue about that. And that is that a certain theory in morality, I think, has to be implicitly rejected in order to make sense of the pro-life argument. And that's pragmatism or utilitarianism. Let's define pragmatism and utilitarianism. They're different philosophies in a sense, but they both agree that something like the end justifies the means. That... If you can benefit some people by harming other people, that might be okay. That you calculate goodness or happiness or pleasure quantitatively. And also that people are to be judged by function. That there's no final end. Everything is a means or instrument or function for something else. So if you're not functioning in a complete way, a human way, a rational way, an adult way, a useful way, a social way, a good way, that's terribly important. That's the only thing that's important. What you are is not distinct from what you do. And if you don't do good stuff, well, then you're not good stuff. In other words, the pragmatist or the utilitarian would not understand or not agree with the old adage that you must love the sinner even while you hate the sin. I state those three rather dull presuppositions because I want to be totally fair, uh, complete disclosure, and offer opportunities for arguing against my presuppositions as well as my arguments. One other preliminary, and that's a uh, procedural rule. Who's the onus of proof on? The pro-lifer or the pro-choicer? Well, this depends. If we're talking about history and tradition and a community... And if that community is traditionally pro-life and wants to change to pro-choice, then I think the onus of proof is on the one who wants to change it. But if we're just looking at the thing philosophically and logically in the abstract, I think the onus of proof is on the pro-lifer. Because I think human acts, like human beings, ought to be treated as innocent until proved guilty. Similarly, I think the onus of proof is on the theist, not on the atheist, to give some reason for believing that there is a God. If he says, I don't have to give any reason for believing there is a God, you have to give me a reason for believing there's not, he could fairly reply, well then, why not believe in the Loch Ness Monster, or uh, the Abominable Snowman, or Santa Claus? So I accept the onus of proof, and here is my attempt to show why the pro-lifer argues against abortion. The essential pro-life argument has three premises. And therefore, the pro-choice rebuttal is of three 
possible kinds, depending on which of these three premises the pro-choicer accepts. But if all three premises are true, then the pro-life conclusion logically follows. So in order to deny that conclusion, you have to deny at least one of these premises. Notice the structure of the argument. The first premise is factual. It has nothing to do with values. The second premise has to do with a natural value, the value of being a human person. And the third premise has to do with a social value, a conventional value, a legal value. So the second premise is about the natural moral law, and the third is about the positive civil law. First premise says that the life of each individual member of a species, at least of mammal, begins at conception or fertilization. That's when a genetically new and genetically complete individual first comes into existence. You got your genetic code at that moment. That's a truism that was taught in all the biology textbooks in America that were written before Roe v. Wade in 1972. And I haven't been able to find any biology textbook except those written by Christians for Christian schools that repeated that after 1972. Yet the new textbooks did not appeal to a single new scientific discovery to justify their change. It was purely political. I'm not suggesting that the textbooks were written by pro-choicers. I was suggesting that the textbooks wanted to avoid political controversy. So the first premise of the pro-life argument is uh, that all humans are human. Whether they're embryonic humans or fetal humans or infantile humans or young humans or even teenage humans. <laughs> or mature humans, or old humans, or dying humans. Second premise is that all humans have the right to life because they're all human persons. All humans have human nature, whatever that is. They share the human essence. We're all essentially human. We're very, very different from each other, but the way in which we are the same is much more important than the way in which we are different. Now, Here's another philosophical presupposition. A nominalist is a philosopher who believes that all universals are nothing but names. So there is no such thing as human nature. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the nature of a chair. We just call all these things chairs because we think in a sloppy way. We should call that Helen and call that Olga, but we don't have time for that, so we call them all chairs. That's counterintuitive. That's not commonsensical. Most people are not nominalists. Most people believe that there is such a thing as human nature and that we all have it. And that makes us all essentially equal. So the universal right to life is a deduction from the most obvious of moral rules. Granted that there is human nature, there's an equality in essence among all of us. Therefore, the golden rule or the rule of justice says, since you don't want others to kill you against your will, you ought not to kill them against their will. It's just not fair, not just. Different ways of expressing that. You could deliberately base it on the ontological good of human nature, or you could be deontological like Kant and formulate this in a kind of a categorical imperative. Each, I think, will work. The third premise is the legal premise. It's about the function of the law. It says the law must protect the most basic human rights of all citizens. Well, if all humans are human, and if all humans have a right to life, and if the law must protect human rights, then the law must protect the right of all humans to life. Self-defense is not excluded by this, because if my life is as valuable as yours, and you're starting to attack me, and you threaten to murder me, I have a right to defend my life, if necessary, by taking yours. In a sense, you have given up your right to life by threatening somebody else's. So defensive war is not outlawed by this. This is not a pacifistic premise. Now, there are three different kinds of pro-choicers. Those who deny the first premise, those who deny the second, and those who deny the third. Back in the 70s, shortly after Roe v. Wade, when philosophers started arguing about this even more than they did before... Most pro-choicers denied the first premise. They said either in a popular way that the thing you abort is only a potential person or only a potential human being, or they said it's only a bunch of cells, or it's human biologically, but it's not really a person with rights. That was the strategy. I think those arguments can all be answered, and maybe I should take the time to do that now, but I think